Welcome to this week's Exporting Malta with me, Monique Chambers, and my guest this week is JJ Gatt from Ebo. That's right. What do Ebo do? You're the CEO, in fact, so you can start from the top. Right. Well, so Ebo is a technology company. We kicked off in London, and we have a base here in Malta, too. We are focused on artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. which basically helps us understand human language, just like humans do. Okay. For the layman? Well, for the layman, it means there are many things that occur in life, like um, calling a call center, obtaining service from a hospital, dealing with a bank for a particular service, for which we typically think of human operators Mm -hmm. taking the call on the other side of the line or processing a form from the other side of the site. Um, With the abilities we have in today's uh, computer science world, um, we are able to process a lot of that through uh, an artificial brain, which we call AI, and it's a term which is often uh, misused and misunderstood, but it essentially means the ability to mimic human cognitive skills, thinking almost like a human, but actually using bits and bytes. Okay, so how do they do that? So if, I, if I'm going on to my health insurance and I want to renew, what does the bot see? How does the bot know how to respond? Right. The lovely thing about artificial intelligence is that um, most of us use it without knowing, right? It's suggesting the next tune that you should listen to on Spotify, the next movie you should, you know, watch Uh on Netflix, next book to buy on Amazon, so on and so forth. Perhaps even, you know, the type of seat you should purchase in your next flight. So um, the artificial intelligence brain learns in the same way a child does. So it picks up large um, bits of data. Mm -hmm. um, We call it the machine learning process, which informs this brain of how to think about challenges. And the more data it has, the better it becomes. And it not only becomes better at answering, but it also becomes better at formulating the question. In fact, the, the, the quip here about, you know, sort of information and knowledge is, as we get better at this, and, you know, Google, which obviously uses AI in most of its processes, mm-hmm. becomes better at this. Um, you know, Google forms your questions in search better than you form them in your head. And, of course, that has become a problem because we do create some um, lazy humans. But, of course, the issue is really technology. Usually the issue comes back to formation and education, which is um, great that we're here in the University of Malta because it brings us back to think about what is the role of university and what is the role of education in today's mm. day and age. And, above all, communication doesn't matter what we're doing communication is absolutely the key always and um so because i i you know sometimes you want to i don't know flirt a bit with your customer service person because you want a good deal or you want whatever it is does that work with robots then? Ah. <laughs> so. i i um i love these questions um right well, I'd say artificial intelligence is typically really good at processing, you know, straight line activities, stuff which doesn't require emotional uh, intelligence, stuff which doesn't require uh, flirtatious activity. <laughs> but I do believe that, um, you know, beyond the need to um, communicate effectively, there's also the need to act quickly. So if, if you look at today's, you know, global business landscape, uh, banks need to be faster, governments need to be more proactive. Um, educational institutions need to be faster at um, offering a, a channel of open communication to its students. So what I mean here is we are in the world of instant gratification where you expect that a problem is solved in three to five seconds. You know, So there's this dichotomy, this sort of dual world in which on one side you gain access to your health information from an Apple product instantly in real time by looking at your watch or phone and maybe get your heart rate or so on. But getting access to public health care may take several weeks. So this dichotomy creates this, this, um, this sort of sense that the physical analog world is too slow. So when you have a customer who interacts interacts with, uh, with public healthcare, with a private bank or so on and so forth, and the service takes 30, 40, 60 minutes or even more, it just becomes unacceptable. So I, I do believe that although the plow- power of flirtation is fun in communication, I think we sort of trump that with this societal need to get things done fast and to get them done effectively. And it's a, it's a transaction, you know. If you've lost your credit card, or if you want to change your appointment in, 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 in a hospital institution, you, you probably just want to get it done, you know, at 9 p.m. when you get home, you're comfortable in your PJs and just don't want to talk to anyone. You just want to complete that transaction and move on. And that's okay. 
So no flirting with the insurance man. I'm bot afraid not. Anymore. <laughs> it's interesting that you said the insurance, <laughs> the insurance man. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know about uh, AI's gender, but uh, I tend to think of it as a sort of, you know, a, a gender neutral reality, which, um, uh, well, you know, you, you, you touched on this particular topic, Monique, which is so interesting because we talk about bias. So one of the key pitfalls um, in artificial intelligence is if it had to, uh, you know, replicate the bias mm -hmm. which we have in our present society, we are trying to build technology which excludes that bias so it could have more levels of fairness, openness, mm -hmm. transparency, explainability, which makes the outcomes of an artificial intelligence tool um, better than the outcomes of a um, human tool. So, for example, this is great case study in America where they put in um, an AI tool to, ass to assist in parole decisions. It's a very, um, you know, okay. well, it's a very mathematical process. You know, you're looking at the records, you're looking at conduct, and you determine whether this person um, should be allowed parole or not. So they said, we can't handle this. We don't have enough human muscle, human capacity to do it. Let's bring in AI. But what they found is that when they used all the past 20 years of parole decisions, mm -hmm. right, to inform the AI brain, they were ingesting bias. So Caucasian males were given uh, yeah. parole, uh, whilst, um, you know, African Americans were typically not. So we ingested racial bias and created a tool which then perpetuated that into society. So it's interesting that you talk about gender, because I think the future of AI tools need to ensure that our basic um, human rights are protected correctly, and concepts of fairness and openness need to become the pinnacle um, of the ethical framework with which we build artificial intelligence. That's true, because I was thinking when I do online shopping, which I do too much of, <laughs> I think that that's a woman at the end of the line and she completely understands how desperately I need that in the next size. Right. Whereas, yeah, there are sort of other things. Like, yeah, it's almost like the sympathetic you want to be, you, you choose depending on what you're, you're using. So, that, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that's quite right. I think we all, um, this is a stereotype for almost every type of role and every function um, in society. And to some extent, um, that stereotype can either impede or help society grow. I think um, if you had to look at the industry I form part in, you know, IT and computer science, one of the biggest problems that we have is the low participation of females because the stereotype here is that the programmer, the geek, is typically male. Mm. And I think that's an issue um, because what we do see from the fewer females who participate in the industry is that they're brilliant, they are absolutely outstanding, uh, which means that they are organized, focused, dedicated, have the right work ethic, and so on. So I think we need to um, play an active role in sometimes breaking that stereotype and encouraging certainly more people into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, because that's exactly what we need. And surely women also bring um, empathy that you have to program in. Surely you have to have a sort of the gentle ear, because we're not expecting just people like us in our, our 40s. To, so I'm looking at you because I don't know if you're 40. <laughs> Sorry, I am <laughs> in our 40s. <laughs> or, you know, but if my mum has to use it, she's going to, you know, want to speak to it in a different way sort of yeah. thing. So you have to have an empathetic yeah. aspect. Yes, I, I think um, empathy is a critical part of communication. And, um, you know, make no mistake about this, AI will never replace um, human abilities in the sense that it cannot demonstrate a level of emotional intelligence that a human can. Mm -hmm. But the cognitive abilities of AI are becoming better and better. So today, artificial intelligence can understand sentiment. Now, sentiment um, awareness mm -hmm. is relevant because you could determine whether the other person on the other side of the chat or whatever to you or, or voice uh, activity is uh, sad, happy or angry and that means that you might change the part you take that user through mm -hmm. based on the understanding of his or her sentiment and sentiment is an important part of our you know um, spectrum of cognitive skills so AI is becoming much better uh, more akin to human cognition. It's not there yet. Uh, that's a process which we call singularity, getting to um, matching uh, human abilities. But we're certainly moving there um, slowly, even in terms of uh, creativity. Um, only last year there was this beautiful uh, sculpture 
um, incidentally called Deo, um, which uh, which was entirely built by an AI agent with no human involvement and creativity. So you know this idea of creating something new out of nothingness. Um, is a very relevant philosophical concept because creativity is, again, part of the cognitive spectrum. Mm -hmm. So seeing machine being able to um, move through this spectrum and um, emulate, to some extent, human cognition is, is an, an important, uh, let's say, a philosophical point to note. Because there are, you know, uh, or um, there are, I'm asking, are there um, sort of keywords that the, they know then, oops, we better move her on because she's getting mm. pretty angry here. Um, there's, you know, there's a, an online, I don't want to call it a bank, finance organization, and you just can't speak to someone. Mm. And it actually makes you want to put swear words in your messages, <laughs> you know, to like, can somebody pick up on this? I'm, you know, gonna lose, gonna lose it, you know. So right. Is there a way that they understand, oops, this does need human or this does need, the next bot up or whatever is there a right, right. so uh, well artificial intelligence understands both the content mm -hmm. and the context of okay. what is being said so content would relate to specifically what is being written but context relates to all those um, elements beyond what is being written it gives you a better understanding of the the scene so um you know, in a human to human communication, we are able to read uh, body movements, we are able to understand sentiment, gesticulation, and so on. In the same way, AI is able to understand the context of that communication. So that includes sentiment, you know, the time of the day, the type of device you are mm -hmm. utilizing in the transaction, maybe the previous history before that communication started. So that context awareness allows the AI tool to detect frustration, which is what you, what you referred to earlier. And yes, it is correct at that point in time to get your AI tool to move you on, perhaps either to human assistance or to the next stage of the conversation because it did detect that degree of frustration in the context or the content, if you're a bit explicit in the way you wrote, ah. of the conversation. Or how, can it tell how fast, you know, your, your typing is getting faster and faster? And Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, Absolutely. Yeah, that's amazing. Actually. So one of the things that we look at in um, ethical AI discussions is um, how much of the context should AI be aware of without mm -hmm. human consent? So, for example... Uh, one of the things that Instagram does very well is look at the speed at which you scroll past images. So if you are slowing down your scrolling, it detects a degree of interest. And perhaps then you pause on an image for a second and maybe even zoom in. So for you as a user and for many users, it's just a gesture. You know, you're scrolling fast, scrolling slow. But what that does reveal is sort of a, a degree of the psychology of the usage. So you're interested in this type of picture or that type of picture. And then if you're zooming in, you're interested in that type of detail in that type of picture. So all of that data is then being used by Instagram to surf up to you the type of image that you are most likely to enjoy. So that is part of context awareness. Mm -hmm. So the speed at which you scroll and mm -hmm. use the example of the sp speed at which you type. Um, uh, and so all of these are inputs for the artificial intelligence brain to determine the next relevant action. I think the interesting part of the conversation, however, is not what we could do from a computer science perspective, because I think there are boundless opportunities, but from an ethical framework, what would we like to allow? What would society believe to be uh, fair um, and allowable, and what should be not um, allowable? And I think that brings us down to a discussion about trust. Um, I firmly believe that we have an ethical responsibility to build trustworthy AI because as society becomes more dependent on artificial intelligence and not simply the trivial examples of what movie to watch, uh -huh. but, you know, um, uh, cancer recognition in uh, x-ray files uh, or medical files, um, uh, dating apps which determine your offspring uh -huh. eventually, uh, next abilities that we have in gene editing to determine what uh, the generation after ours will look like. I think there are some huge ethical boundaries mm -hmm. over there. So we need to build trustworthy AI. So as society becomes more dependent on these tools for the way it trades in its economy, for the way it looks at its healthcare systems, we need to trust it. Otherwise, it will not be effective. Even if it is extremely capable, it will never be um, accepted within the concept of society. So the, the companies that are taking it up now, we've mentioned sort of med medical insurance, are they the ones that, and finance, are they the ones that you are targeting more because they have so many transactions 
as well. So that's the, the key. And that's based out of London or that's based out of Malta? Right. So um, any organization that has a huge volume of communication with the end customer, so that's typically any large B2C organization, mm-hmm. so healthcare, telcos, um, financial services firms um, in Malta, gaming companies okay, and others. Okay. Right? Oh. Whenever you have a volume of B2C transactions which become almost impossible to be managed by an army of people, those are candidates for automation and that is where artificial intelligence comes in. Um, of course, you know, when you speak about the healthcare sector and the financial services sector, uh, the UK is a critical market and it's still post-Brexit is the single largest um, European FS financial services market. And the NHS mm-hmm. is the fifth largest employer in the world. Wow. Right, with an annual budget of um, around 170 billion pounds per annum. So it's a, it's a huge, huge entity and chipping away at the pain points which this um, organization has is a very relevant business challenge for us and we're very motivated not simply by the computer science element and the technical wizardry, Mm -hmm. but the fact that you change people's life positively by providing a service which is previously unavailable. And I think one of the the key factors, I know for me, you know, I'm one of those people who does do their internet shopping at stupid o'clock at night. And if you have a question, you don't have to wait until the morning. You don't have to look at time zones that you can get help whatever time it is. So I'm, I'm assuming with the NHS, for example, you can get help whenever it is. You'd have to stay taking time off, queuing up, um, you know, trying to see the right person at the right time, you can shortlist yourself sort of thing. Absolutely. And um, not only is it efficient from a consumer or patient standpoint, mm-hmm. but if you look at um, budget deficits, you'd realize that in healthcare, one of the biggest problems that exists on a European level are no-shows. So people who don't okay. typically turn up for their appointment. It's a huge cost to the government, to the public health care system, mm-hmm. because you've got clinical time which is being wasted, and often, often you have medical items which are prepared which are being wasted. So when you analyze the root cause of no-shows, often it is simply because the patient doesn't have an effective communication pathway to inform the hospital that, hey, I'm sick, I can't make uh. it, or my dog is unwell and I can't come. So if you solve the root cause, which is actually create an effective communication pathway, uh-huh. then you actually solve a more important underlying issue, which is wastage in public expenditure, which is a pity because that's coming from our tax money, so it could be used more effectively. Uh-huh. So using artificial intelligence correctly doesn't simply bring pleasure and satisfaction and instant gratification to the patient, the consumer of the service, but it also offers quite a sterling service to the government whose coffers are made available for the creation of that particular um, service. But it it sort of sounds very fancy-schmancy and must take a lot of, you know, neurolinguistic stuff and you must have lots of bits and bytes and servers and all that sort of thing. So is, is AI an expensive thing to do? Um, can you replace, obviously you've, you've got all these other benefits to the consumer, but can it replace the human in terms of cost of an employee versus, you know, machine? Right. Um, well, so I, I think there are two questions in this. I think that, so. The first one relates to um, uh, sort of misunderstanding of um, AI's capabilities and cost. I, I think um, one of the biggest issues that I battle with often um, is there's so much hype around artificial intelligence, which is often incorrectly created by marketing campaigns and you know a lot of buzzwords being thrown out. Is that we we find it hard to separate fact from fiction. So real capabilities versus science fiction. Very you know, clear understanding uh, you know about cost versus opportunity. Um, And I think it is the obligation of people like myself in the industry to focus on AI literacy, to really spend time explaining key concepts around artificial intelligence to the average man um, who may be interested in understanding this a little bit more. So once we do that, we need to critically evaluate the cost of AI versus the cost of human employment. There is no doubt that when you have a technology system which doesn't punch in or out, does not have vacation or sick leave, is not a Affected by the coronavirus and <laughs> as, <laughs> the kids aren't ill, etc. It's not stuck in a traffic jam, you know. Right, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not unionized and so on and so forth. You obviously have higher levels of um, productivity mm-hmm. and efficiency. So there's no doubt that if you had to simply evaluate uh, cost, you know, AI will always trump human activities in the tasks which are uh, comparable to that which a human does. 
But I think the wider discussion that we need to have is what is the role that AI should um, have um, in the world. And in my view, it is not the replacement of the human, but it is rather the ability to augment human intelligence, especially in tasks which are of low value, which do not give any degree of satisfaction to the human employee. So we're talking about call centers earlier. There are, there's a lot of research out there which actually indicates that jobs like those, which create a large amount of repetitive activity on the employee, tend to create low levels of job satisfaction, create high levels of churn and attrition, yes. and actually don't create very positive career paths for the person in that role. So it's good for AI to take over work which has... Um, this level of repetitive character and it is our responsibility as an employer and as a government to ensure that we are thinking about the jobs of tomorrow because Skilling today's students for the reality which is going to occur, you know, in 10, 15, 20 years' time is, is critical. I mean, you know, the, the university here is very good at creating, I don't know, you know, tomorrow's lawyer or doctor and so on, but are we thinking about what the jobs of tomorrow are likely to look like? Mm. You know, are we thinking about, you know, your 3D plumbers? Even simple what? manual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that your, your typical handyman is going to look very different in two or three years' time. And is he going to turn up on time? Because that's like... <laughs> I That's ho- key. I hope he does. <laughs> if he could be a robot, that would be great. <laughs> well, you, uh, well, you, you know, um, uh, chatting with your handyman is also fun. Well, I, I do think that the skills that we'll need um, in a couple of years' time are going to be very different to the ones that exist today. And we have, you know, v- you know, very important responsibility to think about the gap which exists between uh, where our ed- education system is now and where we need to be in a few years' time. So for if we're talking to, you know, Maltese and uh, kids that live here and they're in secondary school now and they want to be part of the future, which, you know, they're going to have to have jobs. Um, you do have to have jobs. Uh, <laughs> what should they be looking towards, especially you're saying about young women, what should they be looking to study? What kind of skills would they need to work in this world of AI? Oh, brilliant question. Um, I, I think AI will always find it um, very hard to negotiate, um, you know, complex social uh, relationships and sort of, it, it will be hard for AI to provide creative solutions to complex problems. And I think this brings us to the point that information, which we've been talking about, and knowledge are two very distinct concepts. AI thrives on large um, um, um data sets, large uh, amounts of information. But what humans do in a process of self-reflection when they distance themselves from the information out there is they distill knowledge. And that knowledge is very critical to create um, the creative output that we need in, in, in problem solving. So in a world where there is a cognitive overload of information that we are constantly bombarded with, Humans should not try to trump AI's ability to process large amounts of information right. in and out. So the jobs of tomorrow, the skills which we'll, we will require um, tomorrow, are likely those which are knowledge creation mm-hmm. skills, which are based on soft skills. And I think that is the part which we are often um, missing in our um, you know, educational scorecard and in the determination of where we should be in the future, because it is rather silly to try and beat a machine on computational matters. So, for example, the role of an accountant, typical bookkeeper. Today, in the big four, you'll see most of them employ more data scientists per capita within their organization than Google because they realize that the typical bookkeeping and audit process is one which you could automate pretty much to 80 to 90 percent of the way. So why are we producing, why are we teaching accountants uh, traditional accounting where that level of computational activity has not been matched but surpassed yeah. through artificial intelligence and that um, that gap which has been created is never going to be recuperated and it doesn't need to. But what that does mean is that the people who are going down that particular stream need to understand the soft and cognitive skills which are necessary in the future. It's the consultative ability, you know, right? strategy, change and in truth when we talk about technology, what we're really talking about is the ability to navigate change. Right, mm-hmm. change in society, change in industry, change in enterprise, and so th- with all of this change as well, and we're, we're talking about you know bringing young people into future careers. Um, again, talking to 
a 20-year-old versus talking to a 40-year-old versus talking to a 60-year-old is also different. So when you go into whatever system and, you know, the, the other system recognizes who you are from whatever means, do they then realize like, oops, okay, this is a, you know, 50-year-old woman, she's blah, 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 blah. You know, we've got this history on her. She's a really good customer. Do they talk to you differently than they do to the 20-year-old who's a new customer who, you know, is kind of down with the kids and a different language? You know, is there a is there sort of slang and colloquialism in, in AI? Absolutely. Um, I, I think it's not just the language which changes depending on the user profile. It's also the channel of communication. So uh, in the UK, we see um, youngsters in, interacting with public health through um you know, Twitter, Facebook Messenger, Slack, um, uh-huh. or web chats, yeah. whereas the elder population typically using voice. Mm. Um, so voice AI becomes important in understanding um, certain aspects. So yes, the communication channels mm-hmm. will change, uh, communication patterns will change. And, and let's be clear that when we're talking about innovation and talking about change, change is not the problem. It's typically the resistance to change, right. which is which is sort of a, a subtle argument to be made about um, how does society react to these huge, um, uh, you know, uh, this huge metamorphosis in capabilities which exist out there. And I think going back to the discussion we had earlier about trust, society will never trust a tool, however, um, you know, however elegant it is, if it does not have some key um, ethical parameters which it respects. So the privacy of your data. If you're 20 or if you're 60 or there are different notions uh, based on age relating to privacy. But privacy is a sacrosanct right, which needs to be embedded into the tool you interact with. And if you trust it, then you'll be happy to change to actually use it. So I, I think in, in, in conclusion, I'd say that living in the midst of this huge um, societal change that artificial is um, bringing about, I think it's critical that we think of technology not as an instrument, mm-hmm. as that thing which we use, but rather of a way of seeing the world, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's an optical change um, in how we act, in how we, in how we operate, rather than a tool which we use for our needs. So something we all have to get used to today, tomorrow, and the day after that. It will reveal what it means to be a human, but through a different optic. Fascinating. Thank you so much, JJ Gatt from Ebo. Been fascinating, fascinating talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of Exporting Malta, produced by me, Monique Chambers, with technical assistance from Carmelo Grec and Redent Abdilla. This show is aired every Tuesday at 1.30pm and repeated on Fridays at 7.30pm here on Campus FM.